my pleasure to welcome you here to this lecture today, uh, to this place at Knox College, and just to say a little bit about this lectureship. In fact, I went into my file this morning and pulled out a copy of the original document, 1953, when this lectureship was set up in memory of the late, very reverend Charles H. McDonald, D.D., and it was set up by the Reverend R. Douglas McDonald, Mrs. D William A. Henderson, Mrs. A. Mundell, and Mrs. James O. Brisbane, members of the family. Uh, it was set up, started out with $2,000, and has been added to over the years so that we're able to continue bringing to you uh, this fine lectureship and having more and more participation in it as the years go by. There are members of the McDonald family here today, and I know Margaret Henderson always goes, oh no, when I say, I would just like them to stand and be recognized for the contribution that their family has made. John and Mark and Rory, thank you. <laughs> Wisdom 
and those conclusions in his teaching here at Knox College, equipping students that go out from this place to have a deep knowledge of the church and the Canadian context. So it is my privilege to introduce Stuart to you and to ask him to come forward at this time. I'm honored um, to present the McDonald Lecture this year and appreciate the confidence of the committee and the family and the support of those who established the McDonald Lecture and uh, all who've worked hard to make today happen, and not only here, um, but also in some remote sites. I think that's really quite exciting. Our topic, as you can see, is the Church in Contemporary Canada living in the wilderness. And what I want to do today originated in a paper I was asked to give in Cuba last February during our intercultural international uh, intensive experience. To keep the story short, I was asked to present in Cuba, and the theme was discerning the signs of the times. But I interpreted, possibly misinterpreted, that to mean offering some reflection on the situation of the church in Canada. This was, as many of you know, not a new theme for me. I've been inflicting my ideas on my friends and students and basically anyone who would listen for quite a long time. And these have also always been areas where I have done um, some, a lot of reading and some writing. And this has more recently uh, become a major area for research and writing. But I started writing in this area when I was actually a congregational minister, so this is not something new. But a great deal of what I'm going to say today comes out of that research and work and the research and work that I do with my colleague, Dr. Brian Clark. Brian and I have published in this field, including some working papers that are available on the web uh, that we would invite you to look at later on at your leisure if you're into that kind of thing. And if you think the census is dull, typing in year after year of Sunday school membership and church membership and everything for the Anglicans, the Uniteds, and the Presbyterians, and the Baptists, and the Pentecostals and anyone else we can find. Yeah, there's some work like that that needs to be done in order for us to understand this topic. But um, I'm going to try and keep a lot of that detail in the background informing our discussion, but not specifically the focus of our attention. So it's important to notice that in the background, and we can draw on that when we need to. Given that this is not a new topic to me, what has been interesting both in Cuba and since is that the presentation there seemed to resonate in a particular way with people. And I have no idea why. Which is frustrating because in preparing this lecture, I didn't want to ruin what had worked there, but I really wasn't sure what had worked and so what to change and what not to change. So that's been one of the challenges. The result is I've tried to keep the basic structure of that discussion, although there are some places along the way where I want to take a bit more time and reflect a little bit more deeply. Um, so I'm going to begin with the story as I told it last year in Cuba. And so that's where we're going to start. When I graduated in 1985 from Knox College and headed off to be a minister in two small rural congregations in Ontario, I went to a very different world in terms of the place of the church in Canada. Well, what was different? First, and this is very important, the school day in my community in both elementary and secondary schools began with the saying of the Lord's Prayer every day. 
Second, stores and businesses in Ontario were all closed on Sunday. There was no Sunday shopping. And both of those realities changed during my four years in that first astral charge. Now, and I think this is really important, I'm not calling for us in any way to go back to that situation or those days. But what I want us to do is recognize what they represented and how things changed. What they represented was the strong support by the state, by the government of Canada, for the Christian, specifically Protestant, church. Because our local schools were not Christian schools, they were state-run schools. There were people of all religions in those schools and people with no religion at all. There were Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Sikhs and who, people who didn't believe anything. There were Jehovah Witnesses. They objected to these prayers, as they always had done, so they went and stood in the hall outside because the state said that the school began for everyone, regardless of what you believe, regardless of your religious faith or lack of it, with a Christian prayer and then the singing of the national anthem. Think about the symbolism of that. If you were Jewish, you didn't have to say the prayer, but it was still said. You were part of a country that privileged Christian faith. And in Ontario, state schools, non-denominational Protestant faith is what was strongly privileged. Christian values were also reflected in the laws which determined when people could and could not buy things. Stores were closed on Sunday. Why? Because the province had the Lord's Day Act, passed in the late 19th century, which privileged the Protestant view of the Christian Sabbath on Sunday, and that day being a day of rest. A day when everyone was free to attend church, when, if you want to be somewhat cynical, there were limited distractions or activities which prevented people from attending church. There was limited competition. We had a captive market, at least in terms of the activities people could do that day. And so that was all basically true in 1985. And in a few years, it changed. Canadian Protestants have responded very poorly to these changes. <laughs> many, many conversations I've had over the years about why people no longer attend church in the numbers they once did often end up bemoaning the fact that there is now Sunday shopping and that there is hockey on Sunday. We bemoan all of these things, and what we suggest is, if only these things weren't there, then people would come back to church. Reality check. The evidence is clear. People suddenly became less involved in churches 20 years before there was shopping or sports or other activities on Sundays. They had already done this when there was much less competition. We also should pause and think about what we're saying. Are we saying that we cannot survive as Christian churches unless there are no other activities in which people can participate? Are we saying that we can only be healthy if people have nothing else they can do with their time. We can't deal with any competition. And we expect the state, the government, to go back and change the laws and ensure that people have nothing else they can do on Sunday. Go to church. Now, we never actually phrase it this way, and I know that. But it's interesting, what are we suggesting? We also responded in an interesting way 
when the Lord's Prayer was taken out of the school system. We complained. But we weren't willing, or at least in my experience out in that pastoral charge in my presbytery, we weren't willing at all to find new and creative ways with dealing with our culture and with change. We wanted the old way or nothing. We ended up with nothing. So I'm suggesting that Protestant Christians have not dealt well with that change. So that was the story I told. And the argument I was making, and I am making today, is very simple and very direct. The Christian church in Canada finds itself in a place it has never been before. And it does not have a clue how to handle this situation, this new situation. We find ourselves in a wilderness. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The church has found itself in a wilderness on many occasions in the past. Indeed, one could argue some of the most creative moments in the history of the church have come out of wilderness experiences. St. Anthony in the desert in Egypt is for me the most obvious and powerful example. But we are not living in the wilderness, we in Canada are, I would suggest, struggling to survive in the wilderness. We're not coping well at all. So that's the argument uh, in Cuba and here today. And what I want to do in the rest of my time is really quite simple. It's to explore that wilderness, describing it, describing how we got here, describing our responses, largely blame and denial and then to make some suggestions for how we might live more effectively in that wilderness. And so for our first session, uh, section from now until our break at about 10.45, I want to explore this wilderness further. Why we have some difficulty accepting that we're in this situation, and a little bit about what this wilderness looks like. Then I want to explore further why we struggle to adapt. Then we're going to have our break, and we're going to conclude with a section looking at some thoughts on living in this wilderness, and then some final questions and discussions. Some of these sections will be the same or similar to things I said in Cuba. Others will be amplifications and new ideas. So our first section I've entitled, The Wilderness in Which We Find Ourselves. Now, one of the greatest challenges in discussing this topic is to persuade people that first of all, we are in a new place that I keep calling the wilderness, and second, that there's anything unusual or unanticipated in this reality, and third, that all Christian religious groups in Canada find themselves in essentially the same situation. And I'm arguing all three of those things. I'm arguing this is a new development, it is unexpected and startling, and that all Canadian Christian groups are in this together. Now some may be coping better than others, but we all find ourselves in a new situation. Now I appreciate this is not what you and I are used to hearing. We are used to the implication that it's only Canadian Presbyterians or possibly mainline or mainstream Protestants. Or we're told that this was inevitable anyway, so what's the big deal? Or we told that this particular church is thriving. So getting our bearings, figuring out where we are and why we got here, what the landscape really like, looks like, is our first challenge and quite a significant one. Indeed, I could spend the rest of today talking about that, and you'll be relieved to know I don't intend to. Uh, but I teach an entire course on the various theories uh, looking at what's happened. And there are lots of theories, lots of descriptions as to what's changed and why it's changed, and who is in this new wilderness and who's not. So I'm just going to maybe touch on a few of them just to help us. 
Many people would call this wilderness secularization or secularism. They would tell us this is nothing new, nothing surprising. They would suggest we have been in the wilderness a long time and suggest that since the Enlightenment, Christians have been unable to cope with the new ideas which have arisen philosophically. We've been demoralized and defeated by the new discoveries of science and have been gradually marginalized as the church has been replaced in people's lives. We have not coped with urbanization, with industrialization, and modernization. This is a very powerful idea. You've heard it before. And it shapes a lot of our discussions in North America, our understanding of religion. There is very little evidence for this. This story, which has shaped and continues to shape us, is false. Instead, if we look at the history of the church in the post-enlightenment period, what seems clear is that in the English-speaking world, religion adapted well to developments in science, to losing direct government financial support, to the new cities and industrialization. If anything, the church became more popular and people became more committed. The Victorian church from about 1800 to about 1950 was a strong church. It created institutions like Sunday schools, which had never existed before, mission societies, denominational systems, women's missionary societies, groups, and so on and so on and so on. The church was robust and strong. And so this idea that this change we're experiencing was somehow inevitable is, I would suggest, false. And yet it remains one of the key stories we are told to explain how we got here and where we are. Another story we are told is that certain churches find them, uh, there are certain churches that find themselves in the wilderness, but others are doing quite well. And this story resonates with us, and I think we have to admit this. It seems like in every community there is one congregation that's growing. It's the church that everybody seems to be heading to. Let's call it Hillside Contemporary Christian Church. And so the message seems to be, this isn't a wilderness at all. Nothing fundamental has changed. We've, we're just out of step with meeting religious needs, whatever those are. And if only we were more like they are, at Hillside Contemporary Community Church, all would be well. I'm going to come back, I think, later to some of the themes uh, on suggestions on how we live in the wilderness. Here I'm concerned more with the idea that Hillside shows us that nothing has changed. We don't have to look at the broader thing. That's evidence that nothing has changed. I think that's an important assumption. They're doing well. If we only could find that formula, things will go back to what we remember. So that's the part of the argument I'm looking at. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for this because I do think it's kind of fascinating and quite true, although not studied, that every community does seem to have a hillside contemporary community church. It is meeting religious needs, and people are going there, and other churches aren't seeming to meet the needs in the same way. But that still doesn't change the overall picture of what has changed within Canadian culture and society. It doesn't get us to some of the deeper and more fundamental changes. When we look at the data in the census, or when we look at denominational membership data as a whole, where those exist, what we see is dramatic change. To take the census, in 1951 and 1961, under 1% 1 of the Canadian population reported they had no religion in that category. In 1971, it grew to 4%. In 90, 1981, around 7%. In 1991, 12%. 
And in the last reliable data we will have we have or will have in 2001, it reached 16%. Second largest religious denomination in Canada. No religion. All of the Hillside community, uh, I can never remember the name, Hillside Contemporary Community Churches have not changed this. This is a new reality. This, I'm going to suggest, is change which is happening. Now, Hillside may be doing better at adapting to that change, but the change is still there. And even Hillside lives in the wilderness. One other story we are told is that it's our theology which is the core of the problem. Our theology is why people have left the church or gone to some other kind of church. What's interesting about this argument is that it comes in two distinct flavors. I'm going to pretend they're ice cream uh, flavors for a second. And I'm going to call the first flavor vanilla and suggest that what happened is that we are looking at it. Are we getting feedback on something? Ah. <laughs> the guilty party has confessed, yes. And we all, he buys the pizza, and it happened to all of us. Okay, I'm going to start that again. Uh, it gives me a bit of time to take a, a breath, and you to maybe uh, uh, a bit of a breath as well. As I said, one other st story we're told is our theology. And to try and keep this simple, I'm going to use uh, ice cream flavors to try and get us the idea that there's two kind of opposite things going on here. But the idea is it's theology the problem. The first flavor, which I call vanilla, suggests that what happened is that we remain too rigid in our theology. We fail to adapt to modern culture, and as a result, everyone left. So that's one. The second flavor, chocolate, suggests that we adapted too much to modern culture. We gave away the fundamental core values of the Christian faith, and that's why people left or went elsewhere. Now, both those who argue for chocolate and those who argue for vanilla are saying, in effect, the church is not in a new situation. If we can only choose the right flavor, the flavor that most people want, we can get out of this. And we each know particular individuals for whom this is their story, this is their truth. We know people who've left the church because they couldn't reconcile what they learned in science class with the church's view that evolution never happened and the world was created 6,000 years ago in seven literal days. Now let's lay aside the fact for a while, for just a second, that not all of the church believes that. But people have left. We all have friends who've left the church because they think we've departed from the Bible. We've let women into leadership roles or we've strayed from the biblical teaching on and there's a big blank there and you just fill it in with whatever it is that people don't agree with. Um, but we all know people who've chosen vanilla, we've all known people who've chosen chocolate. But we need to be careful to not, not to assume that this in and of itself explains the larger trends, the larger realities. I'm not sure it does. These anecdotes explain individual behavior, but I don't think it can help us understand the broader trends, some of which we've laid out and one of the ones that's just staring us in the face is going from under 1% to 16%, no religion, in about 50 years. We've got to talk about that and look at that. And by the way, both Brian Clark and I would argue that's a tailing indicator and that it underrepresents what's going on. So that's the optimistic number. Uh, fascinating. Why did we end up here? That's something which is still up for debate and discussion. That's often what we want to focus on is why. 
fair enough. But I can tell you that no one predicted it would happen. If we were in 1961, no one would have said, this is going to happen within the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You won't read that if you go back and look at the information there. And we know when it happened. We now know when it happened. This began in the late 1950s and entered a second, far more radical stage by the late 1960s. So began the late 50s, became more radical by the late 1960s. And we can say something about what it was. This was a massive cultural shift around values. It affected all of the countries of the Western world, Canada, Italy, France, the Netherlands, and of course, the rest of Europe, England, Scotland, Australia, New Zealand, and there are only a few exceptions. Ireland, South Africa, and mostly, most importantly for us in Canada, the United States. It was in this period that the churches, which had been incredibly strong, saw people stop coming. There were less baptisms, less in Sunday schools, less members, less in attendance. We know that. The data is quite clear. The response to this change has been denial and blame. We deny we're in a different place than we have been, and we think that with a minor change here or another change there, we can make this wilderness back into a prosperous farm. Some of the responses I've already kind of been suggesting and noting as we've gone along. We do not accept that this change has really happened and that there is no going back. What we fail to see as well is what was rejected were all of the structures, all of the values that made the Victorian church so successful in the first place. And these were, in many cases, cultural values. We came to believe that the only way to be a church, to be a Christian, was one way. And there were, as I suggested, all kinds of cultural values and forms attached to that kind of Christianity. And when it was those forms and values that were rejected, uh, we didn't know what to do. And we're still struggling to know what to do. We need to be clear and say, it's not that those forms and values were rejected only in the church. They were rejected broadly throughout the culture. And so what are some of these things that were rejected? These would include, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these would include a distrust of sexuality, a deference to all forms of authority, acting primarily out of a sense of duty, regardless of the consequences or what you feel about it. Why, do we, why should I go to church? Because you should. That's, a, that's an appeal to duty. Um, a desire for respectability and a willingness to defer pleasure in order to be seen as respectable. Highly differentiated gender roles. A fear of alcohol and drugs. And again, a sense that it was not respectable to use these or to use them too much. Those are some of the values which had been central to Victorian culture, and they have been rejected. And organizations which had been shaped by these values had to cope with these changes. The Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, traditional gender-separated organizations, in particular lodges, the Mason, the Moose, even some service clubs, have all been affected by these changes. And so have the churches. This has been a shift of values in the culture. For the church, this shift has had particular impacts. First, the values and forms that had worked for us in the past no longer work the way they used to, but we're very slow to change those forms. 
They worked in the past, why don't they work now? They don't. Second, we no longer enjoy support from the culture, and in particular, from the government. The, go the government no longer listens to the church in the way that it once did, or at least we imagine it once did. In Indeed, at times, it can even be hostile. Third and related, the church no longer is seen as the unquestioned moral compass for this culture. The church's values are not considered the best. We see this on issues of sexuality, in particular homosexuality. Now, Canadian culture was hostile to homosexuality in 1916, and largely hostile into the mid 1980s. But since then, the culture has become convinced that homosexuality is natural, and as natural, people have a right to express themselves in loving relationships. They have a right to not be harassed or denied any civil rights due to their orientation. Even more so, the culture has become extremely hostile to anyone who denies human rights to gays and lesbians. Now this may not be universal, but it has become dominant, even only 51%, the dominant position within Canadian culture. The culture has its own moral values, its own principles. That's what I'm trying to describe here. It can accept when Christians and other religious groups agree with those values, but it doesn't change its mind when Christians say, you're wrong. It doesn't necessarily listen. It has its own values, its own principles by which it makes ethical and moral decisions. And the Christian voice may or may not have any impact on that. In the wilderness I'm describing, <laughs> the church no longer has a dominant, privileged place. Not only is this true in terms of support from the government, but also cultural support. And we used to be dominant in our culture. Just think back to the illustration I began with in 1985, uh, no Sunday shopping, um, uh, and, and um, either point. Uh, the Lord's Day of Prayer in school. And, and those may have been at the end of their time, and there may have been changes in places where that was eroding, but it still symbolized something that is no longer there. People don't know what we believe in many cases, and they really don't care. Their lives are full, and they may not naturally think we have anything to offer to them, or we're at least not where they're automatically looking. I don't believe our culture is hostile to the church necessarily. Indifferent is probably the more common response. But the culture does become hostile when we challenge the new consensus on what is moral and what is right and the values that this culture has developed. And those values include values of personal autonomy, of individual expression, of pleasure and enjoyment. And so we suddenly find ourselves in a new place. And that's what I'm describing and trying to explain as a wilderness. And I think we have to start to accept this change rather than continuing to deny that it is not only real, but permanent. We need to learn to live in this wilderness. I'm just going to pause there for a second. If there are any questions for clarification, we're going to have some broader questions later. But is what I'm saying pretty clear? Is there anything anyone has a question about at this point? No, I'm going to press on. And we're going to do the second section, which is struggling in the wilderness. And then we're going to pause. We're going to have some questions and discussions before our break. And we're not doing badly for time, according to my watch, at least. Because um, I know how much is still coming, so we're okay. <laughs> uh, and we will have time for questions.
So that's my first major point, is trying to describe this wilderness and trying to get you to understand what I think has happened and to challenge some of those stories. My second major point, why have we and why do we find it so hard to live in the wilderness? Why is this a, 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 such a struggle? I'm going to suggest just a few reasons, and then we can talk about them later. First, as already mentioned, we've been in denial of this reality, and we've been busy blaming each other. That's one of the big things we've done in the church. And I think that's where that theological point comes in. If only we progressed more, things would be great. If only we hadn't abandoned this value, you know, chocolate, vanilla, everything would be the same. So that's, we've been blaming each other. We started doing this in the Presbyterian Church in Canada in 1969, if not before, with the Ross Report, where we said chocolate. Uh, and in the 1971, we had our first report on membership decline. Most people don't know that. 1971, argued the other flavor. We changed too much. And we've been fighting over it ever since. And it's one of the reasons we don't even talk about it, I think, at General Assembly anymore. Is because we just know it's going to bring out the divisions that exist, and so let's just pretend it's not happening because we don't even know how to talk about it. And we have an incredible struggle to address this and talk and work with each other as opposed to polarizing and pointing fingers. So, denial and blame. The, sec the second quick point I want to make is we continue to have voices saying this isn't the case. So this is again feeds into that denial piece. Um, we've explored a few of these already. Those who say it's all the inevitable result of secularization and those who suggest it can't be real because some churches are growing and those who suggest we all need to just modify our theology. But there are other voices, other explanations of where we are and why. And I think it's important for us to recognize how many voices have been telling us where we are and what we need to do about it. So we always have this feedback that says, no, you're really not in a wilderness. That's a continual challenge for us. Again, we could spend a lot of time here, but I want to make just a few comments, a very straightforward one. Much of what we read comes from the United States. In terms of what has happened and what is happening in terms of religion and society, the United States is significantly different from Canada. That's probably the only statement I could make that everyone studying religion in Canada today since the Second World War would agree with. Everything else is up for grabs, but I think we're all in agreement that the United States is fundamentally different. I think we have almost everyone on record for that at one point or another. And yet, ironically, when we in the church are trying to figure out what we should do, we look to Texas. <laughs> which is not New Brunswick, it's not Ontario, it's not Manitoba. Uh, I think we just need to be aware of that. It's a different experience, we have to honor it and understand it. My suggestion, if I can gently say, what works in the U.S. may not, probably will not work in Canada. What might work is what is happening, happening in a similar situation far more similar to us. So people look east to some of the developments in England. Again, these may not be immediately transferable to the Canadian context, but I think the odds are much higher. And I want to be specific, I said England there, not Britain. I said England. I think there's some better things happening in England than North of the war. Scotland is still very much in it as a model uh, from my experience there. Another quick comment at the risk of being a grumpy historian, and there is no other kind, by the way, <laughs> a great deal of this work has been and is done by sociologists. Sociologists work with theories. They work with theories that are in many ways, or 
they would argue, are cross-cultural and cross-temporal, they cross time. One of the major theories at play, at play, one of the major theories at play undergirding much of the work on Canada and the United States <coughs> proposes the idea that demand for religion is always constant. There is a constant demand for religion throughout history and across cultures. And this is one of the key arguments of Rodney Stark, and is one of the key theories which has informed the work of Reginald Bibby, or at least in particular, the most recent work of Reg Bibby. Demand for religion is a constant. In practical terms, what that means is if there's any changes, in particular decline, in religious measures in a society, it's a supply side problem. There's a problem with the supply, with what the churches are doing. They must be doing something wrong. Sociological theories are sometimes helpful, but they are unhelpful when we have to keep changing and adapting the data in order to keep the theory rather than allowing the data to tell us perhaps a different story. As an historian, I can't agree, uh, as I've looked across time, that demand for religion has always been a constant. There's actually been significant fluctuations. Uh, more importantly, I think this is far more important, the evidence we have, we have suggests something new, suggests something which these theories simply can't explain. So I would invite you to look at some of that evidence carefully, draw your own conclusions. But I just want to be aware that the sociological theories, at times, we keep trying to prove that they are right, rather than looking at what the data is telling us, because I think that's telling us something quite different. My third point, and I think this is the far more important, most important point, why we're struggling, is we can't, we have no experience of this kind of situation. This is a new reality for us. And we not only cannot imagine it, we cannot even imagine how we will imagine living in this. This is one of the gifts of going to Cuba and being forced to sit down and imagine talking to Cuban students and faculty as well as Canadian ones in a situation so different from the one that I'm in any way familiar with. Here we have Christians living their faith in a socialist country where the government has at times been not all that supportive, to say the least, at times perhaps opposed to faith. And we struggle with that. All of our images of being the church rely on cultural support even state support. Christians in Canada imagine living in a Christian country. Christians in Canada imagine if they ever find themselves living in a non-Christian situation that what God calls them to do is change that situation and make it a Christian country. Can we even imagine what it's like to live as a Christian in Cuba? I didn't ask that question there. I, I left that one just hanging, but I did ask this. Can we imagine living as a Christian in the ninth century in Jerusalem, a city with an Islamic government? Or in Iraq in that same period? Or in China in that same period? What is fascinating is until recently, we have not even, in our teaching and our understanding of church history, we have not even paid attention to Christians in those situations. We've defined Christians as those living within Christendom, within Christian governments. And as the territory of Christendom retracted, we wrote those people off. We forgot to look at them as they continue to live as Christians in Islamic countries, in the Ottoman Empire, wherever. We cannot even imagine, I think, many of us, that possibility. 
And as much as we would like to, we cannot blame just Constantine for this. We also have to blame Luther and Calvin and John Knox and Zwingli and Butcher. These were reformers who relied on the power of the magistrates and that maintained the political structures and economic structures of their world. And this is the model we reformed Christians have inherited, a reliance on government and cultural support. And so we can't imagine it. It's not something we've ever had to do. And so we find ourselves suddenly in a wilderness. We have no tools for living in this wilderness. We struggle to even imagine how we might. And this has made much worse in some situations that we continue to hear other voices say we're not there. And so, these are some of the reasons I'm going to suggest we struggle to live in this situation. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I've talked for 45 minutes and 19.7 seconds, <laughs> to be precise, and allow for some questions. Yes. I um the uh, I'm, uh, um the, I'm interested in the handbooks and whether the um how you could you would classify the um, the creation of the handbooks uh, as being vanilla or chocolate. <laughs> okay, so the question and I'm going to repeat it just so that those who are not with us but on the sites can can hear it. Uh, the question is the hymn books, whether I would say they're vanilla and chocolate. I would say a little bit of both. There's certainly been obviously arguments about inclusive language, which are around, you know, how much should we change, how much shouldn't we? That's one of the arguments that, that people do. Uh, I think more broadly, there has been a huge argument about music, and uh, music in churches, and what kind of music is respectable and should be used and what shouldn't be used. And I think that's a important argument to have and discussion to have. The only thing I would suggest is sometimes people propose that if we change the music, everyone's going to come flooding back. And again, that's one of the things I would just be cautious and say. Change the music if you feel that you can praise God using this music. Uh, and look at the language you're using, the forms you're using. That's the church's intent, what we should be doing. But I just don't think a simple change of music is going to bring people back. And so the fact that the church um, doesn't have rock and roll uh, doesn't mean very much. And the, the fascinating thing is not everyone who likes rock and roll hates hymns. And sometimes we hear that, and it's funny, uh, among some of my friends who are musicians, uh, and including among my children, um, that's not the case. They like both. And so I think the simplicity is, is what's troubled me with that argument. So thank you. Other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. When you're, I was hoping you could comment a little bit more about the US influence when we are seeking in Canada to um, find our own way out of the wilderness. And I wondered if you could comment on what we label as the snowbirds or the snowbird influence. Uh -huh. Because I find in public supply and being in churches, often many of the population are snowbirds. So they go to the States, they spend two or three months, and they come back with, with ideas on how Canadian churches should change because in the States, the churches are doing this and this and this. So I wonder if you could uh, comment on that. Thank you, Cynthia. That's a great question. I'm just gonna repeat it as briefly or a summary so people will know. Uh, Cynthia's just raised the question about um, the impact of the United States, and specifically snowbirds who come back telling us what worked in Florida. Interesting. I haven't thought about that as much. What I'm more familiar with, so I'll start with that and then move to the second point. What I'm more familiar with is the speakers we bring up and the books that we employ and the programs that we bring up. So that's what I'm probably most uh, familiar with, and I don't want to pick on any one. Some of them work, by the way. Some of them have insights. I don't want to put them down, but we shouldn't imagine that everything will automatically work. So speakers and programs, 
And we should address speakers and say, I think if we invite them to Canada, we should at least expect them to say what they think is different between their context and our context. And I'm going to be really blunt here. And if they don't know, we should send them home. Um, that's really blunt. But I'm tired of Americans telling me that my situation is just the same as theirs. It's not. I've done the research. Um, same with anyone from England. Saying, we, we have to respect the other person's sensitivity. When Diana Butler asked about uh, both at Knox and at other events, one of the things I particularly appreciate with her is she shares ideas, but she recognizes the difference in the context. And then she tries to translate. Mark Knoll, um, probably the best uh, church historian in North America at the, at the moment, so aware of the Canadian context, so aware of the difference of the American context. There's lots of Americans who have that. But when people don't even realize within the United States the differences. Okay, so that's the program question. The Snowbirds one I never thought about, but that's great. And I think there again, what we may need to do is just talk about the fact that how we need to be more explicit about what some of these differences are. Even within the United States, the difference between the South and Washington State is incredible. We could stick Washington State in with BC in the no religion zone. And American scholars have done brilliant stuff. It's just the stuff that we don't often look at. But the South is a different region. It's back in what I would call the Victorian church or some modification of it. So that's a great question and a great point. My opening suggestion would be just recognizing the differences. Uh, that's at least the starting point. But thank you, that's really helpful. Yes? Um, you mentioned about the school system and the Lord of Prayer and uh, and on the Sunday shopping. But I wonder back to the school system about the fact that we have in Ontario still a Roman Catholic separate school system supported by the government. Yes. And I wonder what you see as the significance of that and its impact of that, particularly for the Catholic Church. Um, so the question is, I was talking about the school system. We still in Ontario, forgive us, uh, forgive us from the other provinces, have a, a, a uh, Ontario uh, Roman Catholic separate school system. What's its impact on the Roman uh, Catholic Church? Fascinating. I think it's one of those things uh, that is a political hot potato that no government wants to uh, touch. I don't think they would ever create it now the way that it was, I mean, Bill Davis's famous decision, and I understand why he made that. Um, I think it gives some cultural support to the Catholic churches, which hasn't happened in the um, Protestant churches. To be as objective as one can, the public school system used to be the Protestant system, the separate school system used to be the Roman Catholic system. Obviously, the Protestant system has become a more secular, using that in, in a value neutral way, um, but there's still that retention. What's interesting is uh, within the Catholic schools, so the, it's the Protestants who lost most. What impact that has had on religious identity in the census would really be a great question to observe and, and study. I'm not sure that anyone's looked at that. By the same token, uh, what impact the Catholic system has on the mass participation and devotion of Roman Catholics is an open question. Uh, I was part of a presentation to um, the bishops and those involved in Catholic school systems a few years ago presenting some of this data and talking to them in a different context about the change. And I can assure you they weren't feeling that they were doing everything right. Uh, they were very concerned that they weren't getting the results they thought they were going to be getting. So yes, it's, we, we still have this hang over. Uh, we still have, if you meet people who, who want to move away from the privileging of, of Christianity in, in uh, Ontario or other Canadian provinces, they will even say, well, the holidays are all Christian. We shouldn't have just Christian holidays. Christmas should be a work day, uh, which would make my 17th century Scottish Presbyterian forebears very happy because they never wanted to celebrate Christmas. Uh, but uh, 
it's a real challenge on some of those ideas. Now again, can we imagine what it's like to be a Christian and not get Christmas or Easter off? What would that do to our faith? I think that's what we have to start imagining. Um, how would we be it? Do we need that kind of support? Thank you. A really great question. Uh, there's a question from one of the mobile sites, so we're going to go to that. Yes, there is an uh, observation about your comments uh, about the differences uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, regarding the earlier question about the differences within the states, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, or Texas, Washington. Yes. So the comment, uh, the observation here is there are also differences uh, across Canada. Ontario is different from the prairies. Absolutely. Absolutely, um, we're quite aware of that, and that's one of the challenges of. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the question was: I talked about regional differences in the United States. Uh, there's also regional differences in Canada. Absolutely true. The challenge in trying to do any presentation of about 45 minutes uh, is is that one generalizes. But I think that's really astute and true. And let me give you the shape of Canada very quickly. Uh, if you go from west to east. Which I think is always a good thing to do. Uh, no religion is strongest in the West. Brian Clark and I have uh, you know, detailed this. Um, and it is weakest in the East. So um, it almost, you know, when you got out of the prairies, no religion is a more common response, including Alberta, which we all hear of as a Bible belt. So that's perhaps a, uh, a bit of a shock to us. The other province regionally that is most fascinating is the province of Quebec, where no religion is startlingly small. Uh, so identity, people saying they are Roman Catholic, remains very strong. But we all know, and this is well documented, that mass attendance is not what it was in Quebec in 1960. Uh, so it's a significant change. But yes, there are those different uh, realities. And that's why I would never suggest that anyone in BC do the same thing that happens in, and that works in Nova Scotia. My understanding is, and for those in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick can correct me, uh, but ministers are still called for functions, as they are in rural communities, um, that they wouldn't be in urban communities. So again, even within our provinces, so we almost have to be cross-cultural uh, in Canada about what works where, what our role is, those who still see us in a privileged position, and those who want nothing to do with us. So a very wise question. Um, there was a question at the back, and then uh, Mark. Yes? Oh, my name is Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned about uh, demand for religion. Yes. I would like to know more about this. Uh, whether there is a demand for Christian religion or in general, and uh, is that does it mean hunger for religion? And another one is uh, some uh, generation difference. If there is any, what is the demand for religion among younger generation or uh, old generation? Could you elaborate that? Yes, a little elaborate. So what I was trying to say, and just quickly for um, those who are on the remote side so they can hear the question, uh, if I could elaborate more on the idea uh, of some sociologists that the demand for religion is constant, is that across generations, and, and so on, and is it, it, is it just for Christian religion? I hope I summarize that quickly. Um, I always find it a struggle to articulate well a position which one doesn't agree with, uh, but this is central to the work of Rodney Stark. And if you look at some of Bibby's work, Reginald Bibby's work, he's taken this from Stark. And you will see in his book, uh, Restless Gods, he will simply say that as a truth. The demand for religion is constant. And so I think what he's assuming, that is, that's across generations and across time and across culture. There is, what it tries to speak to is this idea that there is a psychological, existential need of human beings uh, to have a connection to some source of meaning which we would think of as religion. So I think that's what the theory is trying to get at. Um, so that's what they're arguing. 
And so we would be across all of those situations. One would also assume that it should not privilege one sort of religion or meaning over another sort of religion or meaning. So it should be anyone. One would, one would assume that. But in Churching, um, the Churching of America, Stark's book, uh, he has this little twist that he throws in there that I always find fascinating. Uh, where all of a sudden it does seem to become a certain kind of religion that believes in a certain kind of supernatural God which seems conveniently to fit the Christian God. Uh, so we're just talking and describing a sociological theory. So that's what that theory would be, be arguing. So yes, that's what it says. Uh, my, one of my cases in opposition to that would be England and the... Um, Early, late 17th century, and, and just before Wesley, where the demand for religion was very small because they'd just gone through the civil wars which had been about religion, and people were frankly fed up with it. And so as a historian, I at least want to think through what that means. So, but that's, I hope I've described the theory. I would suggest if you want to, uh, Rodney Stark's book, Churching of America, uh, is, is one that I don't agree with the book, but I, to be fair, that's one of the places that has given us this theory. That's one of the places, as well as many of the other works of Stark, that this has come from. And we clearly can see its influence on Biddy, uh, particularly in the last uh, cycles of books. So. Mark had a question, and then if we will see if there's one from the room outside. Uh, kind of a comment. I was talking with a Catholic priest in a small Ontario town who had just come from Vancouver, where he was uh, the second priest in a congregation with 2,500 families, most of them Filipino, mm. and he had just arrived a few months ago in a small town in southern Ontario, and he's experiencing culture shock. Yes. Uh, so the comment is about the Roman Catholic priest in BC, supposedly secular, but in a uh, parish that has Filipino immigrants, yes, there'll be a lot of mats. But if you come to small town Ontario, where you don't have immigrant populations, yes. This is one thing I just need to say, and I want to be, um, this wilderness I'm describing affects all of us differently, but it is the basic reality. For folks who come from contexts where Christianity may be privileged or may not, as immigrants from Asia, or maybe immigrants from Africa, or immigrants from other places, that's going to affect them differently, both depending on their home country and not really having any expectations of what Canada could be like or should be like. And so um, if you come from a situation where you used to be a minority, your behavior is probably not going to change markedly. But it's interesting the priest's experience, and certainly in the data that uh, Brian and I have done, we, we, it, it does for uh, those of us of European origin, that does seem to be that um, church membership is, is significantly less uh, and, and among traditional denominations. Um, Senator, did you have no We're just checking this site. There was another question. I see Pete Peking, but there was another hand that was up earlier as well. Yes. I'm just uh, interested in your comments with regard to the era of communication we're in and social media mm -hmm. and how that relates to the wilderness, whether it is a positive, negative influence, if you have any feelings uh, about the era that we appear to be in at the present time. Um, that's a good question. So I'll just repeat it. The question is about what I think about uh, social media and those things. Uh, when we talk about this change, particularly the change and the change in the 1960s, people often wonder what the impact of television was, kind of our first media thing that we often think about. And that's a, an open question. Uh, we do see a lot of the change back then, and we're still struggling to understand why. In our current context, I think social media certainly is connecting people in new ways. Uh, I don't think it's gonna replace anything, though. And I guess, so I think it's one of those tools you can use and I think you can use them creatively. What we found, I think, with almost every technological development, they have minuses and pluses 
They can be used uh, for the dark side and they can be used for um, much better uh, situations. So we can have kids harassed and bullied on the internet and we can have um, people being able to call for freedom in situations where their government's oppressing them. So I think, I personally tend to think of, of technologies as not having a lot of values themselves, it's how we use them. Uh, it certainly didn't cause this situation though, this was caused much before that. So, I said, Pei Kang has a question. Dr. McDonald, I want to thank you for guiding me through when I was studying at the Knox College. And it's always a treat to attend your lecture or seminar. Thank you. And uh, about 23 years ago, when I passed by Knox Church, Knox Presbyterian mm -hmm. Church across the street, and they welcomed us uh, like their own family, treated us like their own kids and their brothers and sisters. And uh, 23 years later, when I don't see the largest immigration population in the province of, of Ontario, not reflected in our local presbytery, not reflected in our city, not reflected in our general assembly, not reflected in this lecture room, I'm concerned. When you mention the wilderness, do you mean emotional wilderness or the physical wilderness? Because we live in a city, we know the city has changed. Mm -hmm. Majority of the people were not born in this country. They don't have the name of the McDonald's, McMillan, McLeod, and all these Macs. Mm -hmm. I love these Macs because these Macs loved us before. It's our turn to say, hey, let us go out together, to do this thing together. Mm -hmm. So my concern is when you mentioned that we don't have the experience, we don't have the tools to live in this uh, wilderness. I said, if Knox College could produce someone like the Reverend Johnson Goforth, who travel thousands of miles to convert hundreds of thousands of mainland Chinese. Today, we should be able to have the capacity to accommodate the Chinese, hundreds, thousands of them, here, just in our neighborhoods. Okay, thank Would you. Would you please comment on that? Yeah, I want to comment. The, um, this is uh, probably going to take us more into the second section of learning to live in the wilderness. Um, obviously, we're still dealing with generalizations, and so specific cases become uh, a real challenge. Uh, but one of the things that I think is, is fair to say is that this wilderness is experienced differently, and each denomination is adapting to changes in immigration patterns in different ways. Some are adapting better than others. Uh, some communities are choosing to be part of existing denominations, and some communities are establishing their own churches. And so that's one of the challenges. Um, immigration is one of the issues, uh, but the wilderness I'm describing really doesn't relate to that particularly. It, what it relates to is something called Canada, which has always had immigrants coming in, and the place of religion there. And so from a place of dominance to a place of marginality, or I don't like that word, so I'm gonna strike it up, go back and find another one, to a very different place where you're not sure what you're doing. And so that's really what I'm trying to describe. And I can appreciate that in the midst of that, some of the decisions that are made relating to other communities are less certain and um, perhaps not as helpful, uh, but at least there's the struggle, and so that's what I'm trying to talk about. I'm going to be very, um, I have one last question, and then I think we need to do our break, and then we're going to come back at about 11 and do the next section, so yes. I am not a historian at all, but I, I've been observing the discussion in the papers about the, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, about the anniversary of Vatican, Mm -hmm. too. And I uh, uh, noticed that uh, in, the, in those discussions, there are large groups of, well, the, the, the um, official Catholic position seems to be really stuck in, 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 in traditionalism. Uh, there are large groups within the Catholic Church, the nuns in the United States, the priests mm -hmm. in East Asia, who uh, are trying to press for uh, a more uh, uh, 
awareness of, of the realities of the present time. And I'm wondering if you, besides yourself, you notice any movements in the uh, Protestant church in, in Canada in, in that direction? Not so individuals, but groups of people. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so quickly summarizing the question. So the Roman Catholics, some of the debate on Vatican II people calling us to move forward, and then a question of any movements within the um, Protestant church. Um, so on the first one, Vatican II remains hotly contested within the Roman Catholic tradition for exactly the reasons I've been describing, how it has responded to this cultural change. So we tend to look to the people who think the church needs to adapt more, more progressive nuns and that. And I personally would say that. But we also have the traditionalists saying we adapted way too much. So it is a huge debate within the Catholic Church. Uh, what I think is funny is the Catholic Church thinks it's they did it to themselves, and I happen to think it's just coincidental with this broader cultural change in, in, in um, culture. Um, so this broader cultural change in the West. So I think that's interesting. Groups trying to do something about it, I think the fascinating thing is there are many. That's one of the things. We have been struggling with this. We've been struggling to try to find a program uh, for most of my ministry. Um, my final year at Knox College, we had to do a course on evangelism because we were in the church growth to double in the 1980s decade. And everyone has strong opinions on that. I, have over the years become far more sympathetic to that movement, at least. Uh, but I know we didn't get there. So I think we one of the reasons we've struggled is because we haven't known what we're dealing with. And I think we keep trying to have programs that are going to change a little thing and get us back. Uh, but yes, there are huge uh, movements, the emergent movement, the emerging movement. Um, there are neo, neo Presbyterians who would argue we need to go back to a more rigid uh, Presbyterianism. So there's all kinds of movement. It's almost choose which one you think is going to get you there. Um, my big concern is we actually understand what we're dealing with. And so that's what I've been hoping to do this morning. Um, we've had a few questions uh, and comments, obviously, in the conversation. And then also that have come in from the groups. Um, I'm recognizing one, one really fine comment is, was that one of the things we were talking about in this change might be related to consumerism, and I think that's really uh, helpful and agreeable, and we can maybe think about that more. I just think what's good is we're recognizing that it's a change, and I think that's really good. Another comment was talking about uh, immigrants and immigrants' uh, communities. We actually have a few of those. Um, coming from places and being tied into the church more strongly. We have sociological evidence of that in, in Canada, and I agree completely. Uh, and, and if we are in ministry to, to communities uh, from, for example, Ghana or whatever, we are going to have a different experience. We do need to recognize that. And, um, but much of what I'm talking about and for, is to speak about those churches that have a more European heritage to them. And for those who aren't of European heritage, maybe to help understand and explain the loss that those from those heritages are experiencing and why they're sometimes struggling. And sometimes we can have um, uh, people say, well, why don't you do this? And sometimes it's hard to say we did that and it didn't work because it doesn't work in our context anymore. And sometimes those are difficult but important discussions. So that's just placing that in framework. And one final thing is we had a really interesting example that was shared about the uh, way in which some of this new technology, Facebook in particular, is connecting people. So I think those are really uh, good uh, things just uh, to take out of the morning that first section. So I want to move into the second section. And I want to say, talk about how do we survive? So I've described the wilderness. How do we live in the wilderness? And I just want to suggest a few things. And there are, these are somewhat tentative suggestions. Uh, and they are uh, one area where I've done a lot of thinking since Cuba. So some of these I said in Cuba, uh, some are new. First, our task is not to go back. We need to accept we are here and get down and learn about this wilderness 
and how we'll live here. Our task is not to make this a farm like we used to have. Our task is to live here in the situation in which we find ourselves. So acceptance is absolutely the first thing. It's absolutely important and it's quite hard. And that means we have to leave behind some of the structures, some of the forms in which we imagine church. Can we imagine church without a building? Can we believe God is present where two or three gather and there really are only two or three? Uh, can we imagine that? Now, I'm not an absolutist here. I'm not saying destroy all of the buildings, destroy all of the structures. But what I am saying is that the buildings serve the community. It isn't that the community exists to keep that building on that corner, in that location. And that may be a huge change for us. Buildings, but the same with Sunday schools, or the groups we have in our churches, and so many other things. What do we need in order to be the church in this wilderness? I think we have to accept we're there, and then be open to new visions of the church. Uh, so I think that's the first thing we have to do. And we should understand how significant this is, but also how challenging this will be. I think I said at the first half, our imagining of the church is within certain structures. What does it look like to not have a young people's group, but to bring young people in in different ways? That, that may be how we need to think about it. Uh, so lots more we can talk about perhaps there. But that's one thing, acceptance, and reimagination, all of that together. The second thing I want to talk about is the importance of education. The church must, I believe, teach all Christians what it is they believe and why. So education, adult education, is the most important thing we need to do. And we need to know the Bible, we need to know the wisdom of the church. And some of the greatest resources, strangely enough, may come from the pre-Reformation church, where there were tools, visual tools in some cases, or tools like the seven deadly sins or the seven virtues, which helped people very simply know what some of the cores of their faith were, what God was calling them. Quick summaries. Um, that might be a place to start. Learning the creed, talking about the creed, the key prayers, teaching people how to engage the Bible and going from that basis. So adult education, wherever we do it, from the pulpit, from other contexts, I think that is really incredibly important. I don't know how we lost this focus or why, but I'm struck how we flounder without these fundamentals. In Canada, we rely on people picking up their ideas and values around them in the culture at large, or in the state schools where, incidentally, I had my best lesson on the public reading of scripture in grade six. That's where I learned it. It was all around us. It isn't anymore. So we, in the church, have to teach it. We need to take it seriously. We need to work on it. The Bible has to be part of our education, and I think we have to clearly spell out for ourselves and all members of our church that we are A, a biblical people, and B, we read the Bible in context. That is what being a biblical people means. We need to be able to clearly express that every biblical text needs to be understood in its own time and situation. Once we've done that, we need to strive to understand what it means for us in our different culture 
and our different cultural context and situation. So I'm even saying we need to be right up front about how we read the Bible. Now immediately voices will come and say, you don't believe in the Bible then. You don't believe uh, it's the word of God and all kinds of phrases which take us into the late 19th and early 20th century debates about inspiration. I want to say that in my experience, in all that I've read, everyone, everyone interprets the Bible and everyone interprets some biblical verses allegorically, that is, non-literally. The argument is really which passages we interpret allegorically and which ones we interpret more, quote unquote, literally. Being a faithful Christian for me begins with the realization that we all interpret. No one of us reads the Bible literally. We all take certain passages and make them allegorical. And that's what we need to be clear and up front about is the principle we use in our interpretation. And I would suggest what we need to do is take the biblical writings seriously in their own context and then talk about what they mean in ours and be open that that's what we're doing. In most situations, the message will not change. It will only deepen. Indeed, we may be unaware of the way in which we have unconsciously domesticated the biblical text so that we read it literally or claim to, but then we're not challenged by it. The Victorian church, for all of those claiming a literal reading of scripture, really moralize many sections of the Bible in ways that are quite interesting. It all became about doing, being moral and upstanding. And I would suggest we need to look again at the Gospels in particular, the Sermon on the Mount. And if we hear some of those verses in context, really explore their meaning. I would suggest they will be transformative. They are far more challenging to us than some of the other debates we have or the other ways we read. So I think we really need to take the Bible seriously. I think we need to get beyond some of those arguments about how we read it. We need to say, we all uh, take these scriptures. We all read certain parts in different ways, talk honestly about how we're reading the text, and then say, and this applies to our life. This is what shapes us as Christian people. And this is how I understand it. And then live out of it. And I've suggested the Gospels and the Sermon on the Mount in particular as a starting place. What other texts might speak to us in our current situation? The Psalms, maybe the Psalms of lament, but also the Psalms of joy, of wonder of what God is doing for us. They call it Abraham and Sarah to go into a new land, an unknown land, and their amazing and unanticipated experience on the way. Probably less about David and Solomon and the established kingdom. I'm suggesting, and I'm unaware of this, texts that mirror our own experience. Stories of how God's people have lived in the wilderness or lived in situations they have not expected. I think those can really speak to us today. So education, and particularly the Bible. Third, I want to talk about conversion. It's a word that many of us don't like or have suspicions about. We've seen many abuses of this word, but we need to talk seriously to people, to one another, about the reality that being a Christian involves being transformed, living by different values. We take the faith that has been passed on to us and we make it our own. If we as Christians are no different than we were before, then what are we? In this wilderness, I think we need to be different and consciously aware of this thing. In a world that is so filled with fear, we need to take the biblical message of liberation and live it. In the world that is so convinced that there is too little to go around and so keeps hoarding stuff, we need to proclaim the message of God's abundance 
God's love and blessing and call people to share. We can go on and on, but the point is we must be different because of what we believe. And we have to be deeply different. And we must think how those differences will be received in the broader culture. We sometimes take inaccurate readings and think that non-Christians will applaud us if we take certain stands. They might, but often they will not. They may even be angered if we speak, and particularly angered if we speak with no respect for them or from a position of arrogance, which is one of the default positions when you've been the dominant moral voice of a culture. You can speak with a great deal of arrogance. When I was living in Scotland, uh, this became apparent as there were certain moral debates going on in the Scottish society, and watching how the church engaged in the debates. And if we speak with arrogance, we should not be surprised if we don't get anger and argument back. And so how do we talk to people conscious that we're different and, and actually have been converted, being changed? One of the things that also struck me just recently is, is conversion we often have thought of as a movement into Christianity. In the history of the Christian church, conversion often is to a different way of understanding Christianity or a deeper way of living one's Christian faith. St. Francis of Assisi was a Christian before he was converted to a particular understanding and, and started living. So we can think of conversion in different ways. We don't have to think of it as we've been tempted to, as going from absolutely nothing to everything. Maybe we can think about it in different ways, but I think we have to talk about it and say we are different because we believe these things and talk about the fact that we are and not be afraid of it. So, uh, conversion, thinking about that. Fourth, thanksgiving as a theological starting place. I've been struck in worship recently by how little time is spent giving thanks with what? Giving thanks for what we have, how richly we've been blessed. I find this true in what might be considered more traditional services, and I also sometimes find this true, even more true, in contemporary worship. The prayers of the people are largely petitions. And at worst, they can become very narrow parochial positions for the needs of this community of faith little vision beyond. And so we can focus here at Knox only on ourselves or in our congregations, only about us, but not looking outside and not beginning with thanks. What would change if we began there? If that became where we started, beginning with what we have, I believe that that would be massively countercultural. Most North Americans begin with what they want, not with how fortunate they are. Just imagine if we started as Christian people giving thanks to God. And then looked at, yes, other things. So that's, it's a, it's a quick thought, but I, I really think it's something I've noticed, and um, it's worth thinking through. Fifth, I want to talk about evangelism. We need to invite others in. Again, this is a word and a concept many of us struggle with because of how it's been used and abused and sometimes restricted and understood. But the abuse of anything doesn't mean we should abandon it. My colleague Namson Song came up with what remains for me the best definition of evangelism, I know. Talking to people about why living with Jesus is better than living without Jesus. Or why being a Christian is better than not. Listening, talking, sharing, 
not being afraid to do that. And we all get into all the abuses and all the things that are wrong, and I know those too. And often it's we haven't listened. Uh, but it's not being afraid to invite people to join us. We tell people when it's a good movie. We tell people when it's a good book. Why is this so hard for me? I'm not pointing the finger at anyone else. At me. Uh, I probably dropped my voice there. My apologies to anyone online. I hope you heard that. But I struggle with this, and I just want to acknowledge that. These are a few ideas. They are not fully formed. I recognize that. And you can um, reject the ones you think are foolish. You can accept the ones you think are wise. And if they give you or have any wisdom to them, and if you give them, gives you some other ones, that is even better as far as I'm concerned. But I think what's really important is we actually think about what it is that we need to do to be effective churches where God has placed us in this situation, in this culture, now. And one of the ways that I think we're doing that today is through our entire program. I'm, and we did this last year as well, where we get together and we hear about learning to live in the wilderness, about some of the things that are working for individual faith communities. So I think that's another thing we can do, is we can share our best practices across our congregations. Knowing that we can't always take a model from here and put it there, whether it's a region or whether it's um, a, a rural context or a different community or whatever, but at least hear what's working and share the good news rather than always looking at the bad news. I've lived in London now for a year, and I have to say that most of the Presbyterian churches in London are doing really well. They are vibrant, alive faith communities, different from what they were 50 years ago, but they're places that I'm excited to be part of. Uh, and I think that's something we need to remember. Uh, when I was in, in um, worshiping in Edinburgh, I consciously went around to different communities. There were vibrant communities in Edinburgh. There were also dead communities of faith in Edinburgh. I want to be alive. Well, what was obvious, it wasn't always clear, and it wasn't always the numbers. It's what you felt in places that I would use language about being faithful, and particularly being faithful about teaching. Uh, those are the ones that really spoke to me. That also gives you probably a lot of insight into what I look for in a church. Um, but it was interesting that not a lot of people may go to church in Scotland, but in some of those communities, the church was there, it was alive, it was worth getting up to be there. And that's what we need to do, is what I'm suggesting. I've argued uh, throughout this, I'm just going to sum up now and then we're going to have some more questions, um, that we find ourselves unexpectedly in a wilderness. I've also argued, and I know that you will hear voices which disagree with this, that all Christian churches in Canada find themselves in the same situation. Some are coping better than others. Some claim to be coping better than others, and better than they really are. Canadian Presbyterians are not doing dramatically worse than everyone else. I've also suggested that this wilderness will be where the church will live for quite some time. This is a cultural shift. It is permanent. And we've explored some reasons why the church is struggling. Our desire to go back, our denial of the reality of the change, and the struggle we have to even imagine living in this situation. And finally, I suggested a few simple um, things, and I know that there are lots of other possibilities. But I do offer um, some thought as to places we could begin. The church is not dying and will not die. But that doesn't mean it can remain the same. The church is in a new situation and it must change to effectively preach and the gospel in this situation and be Christ's church in this situation. We have to learn to live in the wilderness. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes for comments or questions, and I'm going to try to make sure that I repeat them enough
that they can hear them on the site. So and so everyone can hear them. Andrew. So if there's no constant religious hunger, is there constant spiritual hunger? Would you make that distinction? And is it demographic support that there is or not constant spiritual hunger? Okay. So the question is, um, I make I challenge Stark and challenge Vivi. If there's no constant religious hunger, is there a conscious spiritual hunger? And would I make that distinction? Is that, that fair? Um, two things. First of all, I really wanted to surface that this was an assumption. I really wanted to make us aware that that's one of the theories that's going on here and make us aware, and then we can start to ask those kinds of questions. So. That's the first thing, and for me, among the most important, that I think we have the right to ask, is that true? Um, I think they would make a distinction between, uh, Stark in particular, would make a distinction between um, religious hunger and spiritual hunger. I think he would want to suggest that that should be uh, seen in institutions, that people being connected with churches and with a relationship to a particular kind of God. Now, someone may have read more of Stark and can say, no, actually over here he says it. Stark puts out about one new book or two new books a year, so I don't try to keep up with all the stuff he writes. Uh, but that's what I would say. But I want to we, we, we still, we, we often hear about this idea of spiritual, not religious. We often hear about this diffuse spirituality. And there's a lot of scholarly literature on that. It's almost an, its own subject. Actually, the one time I had the pleasure, lovely man, of meeting Reg Bibby, and he was so helpful to us, uh, was at uh, a conference, and he was talking about diffuse religion. So it was really interesting to be there. But, so this is an observation. Something to think about. I was, I know this idea, I know this is idea that there's always this constant spiritual hunger. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, I don't know. What I do know is living in Scotland, um, as a non, not consciously as a Christian in an environment where people didn't know what I do for a living, and just walking down the streets and meeting people and having a beer and everything, I can't say I've seen people evidence that they're looking for God. I have seen them evidence they're looking for a good time. Um, Scottish culture has huge issues with, <laughs> huge issues with partying and to almost a manic state. I mean, you know, we've moved from respectability to, to other things. Um, and this is nothing against uh, having a beer or anything. My, my, local, my, my local pub um, actually kept out people who were on uh, pub crawls. They had a gentle way of moving them on. Because this was a place where people just talked and enjoyed each other. We didn't care where you were from in the world. Uh, but if you were out, there were other places. If you were out just to get smashed, there were other places that did that. But Edinburgh on a uh, Friday night is a fascinating place. And I can just say, I didn't see spiritual hunger. Now, have there always been people? who have been like that, I don't know, that's something we can think of. If, if what they're saying has always been 50% who have and 50% who don't, and I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen that in that, but I think it's something we need to at least look at. We assume in the church that's that. I think we sometimes have to generate it. And I don't think we should be ashamed of saying that. Maybe we have to ask people, is your life really full? Yeah, are there things you are missing? Um, that sounds like kind of old style evangelism, sorry. But <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, I think it's just something to, to, to ask. And you may decide that I'm wrong, and I'm quite comfortable with that. But I just want you to be aware that that's one of the things in play. Yes? Go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned the PYPS. Yes. Um, and uh, what are some more thoughts on youth ministry specifically? Presbyterian Church and the way uh, we look at different denominations and different models. Yeah. So how, how things need to shift or 
what are some of your thoughts? Okay, so the question is about youth ministry. Um, I mentioned PYPS uh, and actually kind of congregational youth groups. Uh, I mentioned some other things. Um, so and what are my thoughts? So that's the question. Let me say this. I think if you have a congregation and they have a youth group, that's great. Let's put resources into it. Let's develop it. Not a question. I think the other purpose of a youth group is to help young people take the faith of their parents and make it their own and understand that faith. And so I think without being intentionally preachy, I think we have to have ways of talking about that. One of the things that I would steal unashamedly from the Korean community is their use of retreats with their young people. Because I think that's one of the most formative things. I think another thing we can do with young people is help them develop worship and learn and understand worship as part of the young people. Well, I think there's a lot of things we can do. We've been very bad at um, um, putting resources into that. And I think the Alliance Church, which is one of the success stories of the latter part of the 20th century, did, did certainly invest heavily. The other challenge, though, is we have some congregations that have one young person or two young people and not much of a group. So what do we do there? And so I think that's where, OK, so then we have to start imagining it. And that's where I think we have to support parents who are trying to raise their children in the faith and give them the tools. And the same with Sunday school. If we don't have enough for a Sunday school, how do we take that child, incorporate that child into worship, share the faith with that child, and make sure they know it? So it's, there's nothing wrong with those things. I think experiences like Canada Youth, um, the, the last one we have, is, is, is a great example the thing we always have to watch, though, is we can transition people out of those mass experiences to uh, the normal dredgy grind of, of living a Christian faith. <laughs> and I mean, if, if it's all hugs and everything. And, but that's not a new problem. That, that I certainly, we, um, in my youth, even back in more of a Christian context, we lived with that. I think it's a great question. What I hear too much of is... We don't have enough young people, so we shouldn't do anything. That's what I'm trying to get us away. Or we'll do something when we have a mass, or we'll do something, a mass of young people, enough to do it, or we'll do something when we can hire a youth leader. But until then, no, I think we've got to do it now. Uh, there's a question online. Uh, from Harold Cowenberg. Hello there from Ingleside. A question came up which challenges Dr. McDonald to give us a couple of examples of similarities between challenges of the first century church, which may be similar to the wilderness in which we live today. Okay, uh, so I think everyone heard that. Challenges to the first century church. With all respect, I'm going to say that that's one of the things that I, I struggle with. I don't think it's similar at all. I think it's so dissimilar that we keep stumbling over that. So with respect, can I reframe it? I think it's a good question. I think we need to reframe it. Our problem is we always go back to either the 16th century or the 1st century <laughs> if we're Protestant Christians. And those of you who know me know that's one of my hobby horses. Sorry. Um, I think what makes our situation unique is that we have a Christian memory that is dissipating, and therefore people know enough to not want to be part of the Christian church. And that is not what we had in the first century, and that's distinct. I think we also have hostility. Now there are some similarities we can see in terms of multi-faith, a lack of state support, those kinds of things. There are some things that are similar. I really want to stress the differences. The early church also didn't have the cultural baggage that we have. They didn't have Sunday schools. They didn't have WMSs. There's nothing wrong with those. Those worked brilliantly in the 19th century, but they didn't have those. They created their own institutions. So, um, it's my hobby horse, I'm sorry. I don't think the early church is the best example. I think we really are in a new situation. 
And so I think some of the parallels might be more accurately the transition from being a persecuted church to being the state church. We're doing the opposite way. So how did the church adapt to becoming the state church around the time of Constantine? That might be a more interesting parallel. What did churches do that found themselves all of a sudden under Islamic control or under um, pagan control? What did those churches do? How did they live out their mission? Uh, what, are those in, what are the institutions they used? So I appreciate the question, and I apologize if I over-responded to it. But I think that's our natural bent. We keep thinking we can get back to the apostolic age, the first century. We have 1,900 years of history in between, at least. And so um, that's my hobby yours. Apologies. We had a question there, and I think that we probably will need to break. The question I have, you made reference to the, uh, the American states are functionally considerably different than we are. Yes. You didn't enlarge upon what those differences were. Yeah. The differences between Canada and the United States is a fascinating topic. Highly contested. Um, some of you who get the Alban Institute um, may know that Reg Bibby was just promoting his latest book in a little uh, email shootout last week and kind of suggesting less uh, difference. Although in the past, he certainly, excuse me, on board with more difference. Um, so here's the um, two minute explanation of that. And we could go on forever. There are great similarities and there are regions in the United States which show great similarities to Canada and the rest of the Europe. The cultural change impacted them as well. But something happened in the Carter presidency. The Carter presidency, and right around that time, um, Jimmy Carter ran quite consciously as an evangelical Christian, which you didn't see uh, Pierre Trudeau running as a devout Roman Catholic. So that's politically quite different. And even the reaction against him and the re-engagement of the evangelical community in politics, often uh, more Republican politics, uh, really changed and transformed Ameri the American situation. I think the other reality is, so there's some trends up to about the time of Carter that, that really are similar. Uh, but right after that, things changed. And the United States continued to be a religious culture and a place where people went to church in a way that it hasn't been in Canada. So the, the simple thing is, in Canada, and if you look at the data we've done on, uh, Brian and I have done the United Church of the Anglican Church, I'll pick on the Anglicans. Um, they uh, were doing great, booming in the 1950s into the early 60s. All of a sudden, all of their indicators, their membership, their baptisms, the number of marriages they did, just kept, went down and kept declining. In the United States, Around the time of Carter, there was a pickup, a stabilization, and we haven't seen that in Canada or in the United Kingdom. And so that would be some of the major differences, I would say. So, and I think it's the impact of the South, uh, that, that the, you have one region which keeps religion on the landscape in a particularly interesting way. Uh, and people know uh, that people go to church, they talk about it, and even folks who may not go to church up here in Canada end up going down to the church in the United States. Um, we had a, 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 someone affiliated with St. Andrews Coburg, um, moved down, never gone to St. Andrews Coburg, um, moved down to the States, to Texas, went to church. Everybody goes to church in Texas. You have a, a culture where that's something that people do. Uh, that's very different from Canada, very different from England, very different from Scotland now. Was similar back in the 50s. So that's one difference. The other final difference, um, with religion and politics, I think a lot of the no religion in the United States is a reaction against the religious right. And so they tracks as a fairly large number, but I think it's active hostility some of the positions being put forward. 
Um, and people, so I think in its nature, it's a different number. In Canada, we sadly have not been able to put the resources into understanding that. Uh, but I think there's a different nature. I, I think it's mostly a difference in Canada. I can't prove that, uh, but it strikes me that we have um, a quite a different thing. So, great question, a lot there. 